I want to thank you for downloading or streaming this message from Victory. We believe that the starting point for real life change is centered around God's word lived out with God's people. So no matter who you are or where you are or what you're struggling with, our goal is to inspire and equip you with a new perspective that will give you a better way to do life. And we pray that as you live out God's word, you will truly experience something more, something better. And if you haven't experienced a live Victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us. No matter where you are in the world, you can tune in with us through Victory Everywhere. That's what we're calling our online campus, Victory Everywhere. Or if you're local, we'd love to have you join us here in person. Here at Victory, we're contributors, not just consumers. And we consider it a privilege to give back what God has so freely given us. We celebrate generosity and the work that God does with our sacrificial giving and in our community and around the world. If the message that you are about to hear helps you, inspires you, and challenges you in any way, we invite you to partner with us financially in our vision of connecting people back to God. Join us by going to victorycc.life slash give. Thank you again for watching. We hope you enjoy this message. How you guys doing this morning? Good, good. Hey, this is last like a starting point. What we've been saying is everything, everything, everything has a starting point. And uh, the reality is what we found out is our faith had a starting point as well. So whatever it is you believe, whatever it is you embrace, or even if your faith is in nothing, your faith in that nothing had a starting point. And what, what's interesting is we've all come into this moment from different points on our own faith journey. Some of us are here just investigating faith. Some of us are trying to grow in our faith. Some of us are trying to take what we've learned right here and share our faith with somebody else. But together, what we've been asking is, is this question is if we didn't know anything, where would we start? If we didn't know anything, we just forgot everything that we learned. Well, if we didn't know anything, where would we start? And what we, what we realized is out of the gate, we had to kind of jump over a barrier uh, that was the starting point of our faith. Like, no matter how different you and I might be, Jesus follower or not, skeptic or not, here, here's what we had in common. The starting point of our faith began in childhood. And that had its own baggage, right? Based on what we were taught, based on what we sa- they said, based on what maybe what we read. I mean, even if you didn't grow up in church, the starting point of your faith began in childhood. Back in childhood, you began to put together their own, your own building blocks of God or church or religion based on your experience, based on your disappointments, based on your own journey. The starting point of our faith, we have this in common, it started in childhood. And that was a barrier that we had to overcome. As we kind of come to the last message, I want to help us jump over another barrier because you might not think about this very much, but our doubt had a starting point as well. My doubt had a starting point and your doubt had a starting point. And here's the reality is all of our doubt had a starting point. And regardless of what we believe, here's what we have in common. Our doubt started in the presence of pain right? Your doubt, it started in the presence of hurt or loss or pain. My doubt started in the, in the presence of trouble or pain or heartbreak. See, regardless of what, what you believe, our doubt had a starting point. The dar- doubts that kind of crept in, the doubts that maybe shattered your faith, our doubt started in the presence of pain. There was that moment where you expected God to show up and God did not show up. There was that moment where you expected God to do something and God didn't do what you knew that you knew that you knew he should do. There was that moment where we expected God to keep something from happening and it happened anyway. Maybe it was the loss of an opportunity, the loss of a child, the loss of a marriage, the loss of a dream, the loss of your health, the loss of a loved one. It happened to you. It happened to your friend. 
It happened to your mama. And in those moments, you and I find ourselves in the doorway of doubt. And if we're ever going to try to start or restart or share this faith with somebody else, we just got to figure out, what are we going to do with that? What what are we going to do with all of that? I mean, I don't know how you personally reconcile pain, hurt, and loss with faith, but I do know this. It's so much different than how the first followers of Jesus reconciled their faith with pain, hurt, and loss. See, their faith was not fastened to an imaginary God that said, just follow me, and it's puppies and sunshine every day. Like, that was not their God. Their faith was not fastened to an imaginary God who never let bad things happen to good people. That was not their God. Their faith was in a God that was introduced to them by Jesus. The same Jesus that received the beating. The same Jesus that endured the flogging by the Roman soldiers. The same Jesus who had nails pounded through his flesh. The same Jesus who had a a spear shoved up through his skin, up into his rib cage. That was their leader. That was their master. He was their God. And so when they faced pain, they did not question the existence of God. And you need to know that in the beginning, faith is not as fragile as it is today. I mean, I think some people, just their faith is so fragile today. But that's not back then. They did not doubt God's existence or God's love because they experienced pain and suffering in this world. And here's why. They saw Jesus suffer. And then they saw Jesus die. And then they had breakfast on the beach with him three days later. See, their faith was not fastened to a made-up God who didn't allow bad things to happen to good people. That wasn't their God. And so if you've lost faith or struggled with faith in God because of evil in the world, if you've lost faith or struggled with faith because, because of pain or suffering in the world, I just think you need to give Jesus another chance. I think that you and I should give Jesus another glance because the men and women who bring us the message of Jesus, this this good news of Jesus, not only saw unimaginable pain and suffering, history records that the first followers of Jesus, they actually experienced it. In fact, James James, uh, uh, was killed by the sword. Peter was crucified upside down. Andrew was hanged around 70 AD. Thomas was speared to death around 70 AD. Uh, Philip was crucified. Matthew was beheaded in a remote place in Africa around 70 AD. Nathaniel, we've heard about Nathaniel, he was filleted, then crucified. James the Lesser was clubbed to death. Simon was crucified. James... uh, Judas Thaddeus was beaten to death with sticks. Matthias was hung on a cross, and then they picked up stones and stoned him to death, and Paul was beheaded in Rome. And so when they were confronted with pain, knowing all they had to do was just renounce their faith, when they were confronted with, with pain, knowing all they had to do is just tell, hey, we don't believe anymore. They all still believed anyway. And here's why. Their faith was not fastened to an imaginary God who didn't allow bad things to happen to good people. Their faith was in the God introduced to them by a crucified and resurrected Jesus. They saw the worst thing imaginable happen to the greatest person they had ever known. They saw how God worked in their life. So in the face of their pain, they did not doubt God's existence. They did not doubt God's character because they experienced pain and suffering in this life no these first followers of jesus they were bold and their boldness had nothing to do with religion their boldness was nothing to nothing to do with building buildings or or building the church their boldness had nothing to do with theology their boldness had nothing to do with heaven their boldness wasn't even about trying to escape hell the epicenter of everything that they believe as christians what their confidence was rooted in and found the foundation of their faith the starting point of their faith was the nail scarred resurrected feet of jesus and the new testament documents that what jesus was offering it was brand new The New Testament documents that these first followers of Jesus, they left their jobs, right? So moved by this mission, they left their family, they left their safety, they sacrificed everything to follow Jesus, to advance the message and the mission of Jesus. They were a part of the getting the Jesus movement moving. These first followers of Jesus, they didn't bail on Christianity like you and I do today. They didn't bail on Christianity because they had to give up too much or they had to sacrifice so much or they didn't like a particular set of that teaching. No, they didn't bail on Christianity because they experienced pain, hurt, and loss. No, in fact, when you look back at the New Testament, you discover that pain, hurt, loss, and sacrifice actually grew their faith. 
If you look back and actually read what happened, pain, hurt, loss, and sacrifice grew the Jesus movement to which you say, Josh, I'm glad it worked for them. <laughs> right? That's great for them, but, but I'm still hurting. I'm glad they felt close to God, but I'm like the righteous brothers. I lost that love and feeling. It's gone, gone, gone. My relationship with Jesus feels like Elvis. He's left the building, right? I have some doubts. I have some anxiety. Josh, when I look at my life, things like faith, hope, and love is just hard to come by. I don't know if I can faith the faith the faith this thing anymore because if I'm honest, all I feel is fear and doubt. I can't say with any confidence that I can get my life where I intended it to go. And if there is a God, I must be on his bad side. If there is a God, he must be paying me back for what I've done. So here's the thing. We've all let our experience explain God. So when we look back at our life, uh, we think this is what God thinks about me. This is how God maybe responds to me. This is how God feels about me. And we let our experiences explain God. But when we pick up the New Testament, we discover your experience is not a reflection of how God feels about you. Your your experience is not a reflection of how deep your faith is. Your experience is not a reflection of how hard you prayed. It's not. In fact, when you pick up and read the New Testament, you discover that there were men and women that God absolutely loved. He absolutely knew their name. He knew how many hair was on their head, and he called them to specific tasks. He did miracles through them, but they went through a season of heartbreak, and they went through a season of loss, and they went through a season of great, great pain. You see, our doubt started in the presence of pain. And I don't know how you reconcile pain, hurt, and loss with your faith, but I do know this. It's so much different than how the first followers of Jesus reconciled their pain and their hurt and their loss with their faith. Because when we encounter pain, we think God doesn't know. God must not see. God probably doesn't care. Or maybe, just maybe, there is no God at all. When the first followers of Jesus, they record not the absence of pain, but the presence of purpose. That they follow Jesus who said, in this world you will have trouble. They followed Jesus who died a painful, shameful death on a cross. They were not surprised by pain. You see, before Jesus transforms our heart, we will always be tempted to examine our pain and suffering and loss within the context of our life alone. It's true. I mean, there's so much pain, there's so much hurt, there's so much loss. Sometimes it's so hard to see anything else. I mean, transparently, I stub my toe in the middle of the night and I can't see straight, like, right? Ladies, I know it's been scientifically proven that the man cold is way worse than the woman cold, right? right? I, when I get it, it's so bad, my wife has called the way ambulance. Like, it's just terrible, right? We will always be tempted to examine our pain and suffering and loss within the context of our life alone but when the first followers of jesus write down how to follow jesus they they record not the absence of pain but the presence of a purpose and so maybe just maybe it's time for you and i to rethink the role of pain in fact when paul is writing to the church in corinth he wants us to know sometimes following jesus isn't easy he wants us to know that sometimes following jesus followers they experience pain and heartbreak in fact he says it this way we do not want you to be uninformed brothers and sisters about the troubles we experienced in the province of asia we were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired of life itself he goes on to say indeed we felt like we had received the sentence of death i mean did anyone else roll into this moment feeling that way Did anyone else come limping into this moment feeling this way? Like we felt like we've received the sentence of death. Does anyone else, they have their week and it felt this bad? I mean, if you did, (laughs) the first followers of Jesus would raise their hand and say, me too, you're not alone, (laughs) right? See, what you discover when we read God's word is that God isn't paying you back. God couldn't love you anymore. God's not gonna forgive you anymore than he does right now. It's all there for us. Sometimes God does not remove the pain, right? Sometimes God, 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 God does remove the pain. Sometimes God does keep the trouble from happening to us. Sometimes God does remove all of that pressure, but Paul keeps on writing. He says, but this happened. That's a big but. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on who? God. Meaning, God is saying, sometimes I'm gonna remove the pain, but sometimes I give the pain a job. Sometimes I give the pain a purpose. Sometimes I remove the difficulty, but sometimes I give that difficulty and I use it to grow your faith. I know, you're praying for the exact same thing that I pray for every time I pray to God. The absence of hurt, the absence of loss, the absence of pain, but in this moment, God says, I know what you want, but I'm gonna give you what you need, right? Not the absence of pain, but 
the presence of a purpose. So no, I'm not going to give you what you think you need. And no, I'm not going to take that hurt away from you. And no, I'm not going to remove that pain, but I'm going to give it a purpose. I promise to give it a purpose. <laughs> he goes, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on who? God. To which the atheist in the room says, Josh, great. that's great. Are you telling me that as a Jesus follower, you're just supposed to trust Jesus? Like, I, I, I came limping into this moment, and the best you've got is rely on God. Like, that's the best you got, to which I would have to say, yeah. Yeah, that, 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 you're smart. You know this. We're all faithing in something. We're all believing in something. We're all trusting in something. We're all putting confidence in something that this, whatever this is, is gonna take care of us. So the question is not, do I have faith? You have all the faith, the faith, the faith you need. You have great faith. That's not the question. The question is, what or who am I placing my faith in? Even if you decide to never follow Jesus, you owe it to yourself to know the answer to that question. So Paul says that, that all of that happened, that we might not rely on ourselves, but, but on God who raises the dead. So what was Paul pointing them to? What was their confidence rooted in? What was the foundation of their faith in the midst of, of pain? See, our doubt, it started in the presence of pain, but their doubt had a starting point. It, it did. They, they, maybe if they wrestled with it, their doubt had a starting point, but, but their faith had a starting point as well. What was their starting point? The nail-scarred, resurrected feet of Jesus. To which you say, Paul, Josh, what, what did Paul actually struggle with? Like, what did Paul really have to trust Jesus with? Hey, right, Josh, what were the troubles that we experienced in the providence of Asia? Did Paul get a hangnail, right? Did, did he get a D on a test? Did he get rejected by another pretty girl? I hear he was single, right? Did he pray for a parking space for his mule but got outpaced by another mule? Like, what's the deal with Paul, y'all? Well, in Acts chapter 14, Luke records for us that Paul had been preaching in Iconium, and it says this. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and they won the crowd over and they what? Stoned Paul. Meaning they picked up rocks and they threw him at his head to kill him until he fell down and then they would throw more rocks on top of him. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you believe. Can we agree on this? That's a bad day. Anybody? Because that's a bad day, right? They stoned Paul and they dragged him outside the city thinking he was what? Dead. Now, when you're the person that everybody thinks is dead and they grab your lifeless body and throw it on the ground, right? People, can we just agree that that's a bad day? But Paul writes this, he says, or Luke writes this, but after that, the disciples had gathered around him, meaning that we all are gonna need a group of people to gather around us, right? Even Paul, when he had a bad day, right, he's gonna need some people to gather around him. That's why groups are important. He says, but after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and ran for his life. That's not what it says. That's what it would have said if it was me, right? This is what it says, right? Check out what Paul did. <laughs> but after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. I mean, Paul was so beat up that they thought he was dead. But Paul had like this Kelly Clarkson kind of moment. What doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Like, right? If I'm not dead, God's not done. If I'm still breathing, God's still moving. Paul did not let his experience explain God. Paul did not let his pain create doubt. Paul did not let this difficulty keep him from his calling. No, he stepped back into his purpose. See, the first followers of Jesus, they record not the absence of pain, but the presence of a purpose. I mean, I, I think Paul's like coming back, coming, like come at me, yo, kind of a thing. Right? I, you should have killed me because what you, 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 if you didn't kill me, I'm, I'm stronger because of it. I'm coming after you because of it, right? But, but, it's like, but Josh, you're like, that's nice, but I'm losing my hope. I'm losing my faith. I, I'm, lo I'm, just, I'm losing my mind. And maybe you did come limping into this moment, feeling beat up and left for dead. And I'll admit to you, there are absolutely times in my life where I found it's easy to lose faith. There are. I wish I could tell you that I always knew what God was doing and it was good. I wish I could say I never questioned God. I always knew why he was doing and how, what he was, how he was doing it. But I'll admit to you that I'm not even the strongest one in my own family sometimes. There are days that are just so difficult. And if, there, and if you're like me, you can take a day of that. But when you have a week like that, when you have six years of something like that, it's, it's hard not to lose our faith. I mean, would you believe that sometimes, sometimes I have to remind God I'm on his side? Like, like my prayer is literally, God, remember, I'm one of the good guys. Send me hope, send me sunshine, send me something good. Now, when Paul writes this uh, the, to the church in Corinth, it's written around 55 AD, but seven years later, around 62 AD, not much has really changed for Paul. 
uh, because Paul has actually gotten worse. He's on his way to prison. And in Acts chapter 27, it starts off with Paul telling the captain of the ship that before we leave, I I don't think we should leave the port right now because there's something bad brewing out there. And the captain of the boat says, I'm the captain, you're the prisoner. So go row, row, row this boat. Like that's what he says, right? So they take off for Rome and they hit a terrible storm. And for 14 days, they're lost in the sea. Two weeks, they're tossing and turning in the sea. They don't know whether they're going to live or if they're going to die. 14 days, waves, water sweeping over the boat. I mean, think about this. They were not on the Carnival Cruise Line, right? They were on a boat by some, made by some dude named Frank. Like, I mean, like, that, the thing, the thing's going to bust apart. Like, this is not like our modern-day boats. I, I, two weeks, I'm starving. I'm hungry. I'm seasick. I'm cold, you know, I'm, and wet. And, and finally, the boat, the Scripture says, it runs into a sandbar, and it smashes into pieces and they had to swim to shore can you imagine seaweed all over them they're cold and they're wet and it says once safely unsure we found out that the island was called malta so this is not like once upon a time this is a place that you could go and visit today right they didn't even know where they were for 14 days the gps lady's like recalculating 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 right it goes on to say the islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. So right, just imagine this. You're cold, you're just freezing there, your teeth are chattering, you're shipwrecked, you swam to the shore, you're struggling to get warm, but now there's a fire, right? It's kind of get better by the fire. You're saying, that, yes, Jesus loves me, like you're singing, right? But check out verse three. Check this out. It says, Paul gathered a pile of brushwood and as he put it on the fire, a viper, a viper, driven out by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. Didn't bite him. Uh-uh, not good enough. It fastened itself, just hanging there by his hand. I mean, that's a whole other level of frustrating. Can you agree? I mean, I'll be transparent. I get frustrated when my wife sends me to the store for a specific can of soup or whatever, and I'm in there, I'm like, I don't know what kind we buy, right? So I try to do FaceTime or take pictures, and the internet's not working. I just like like five phone calls later I try to run to the line because I don't want to be in the store and I try to find the fastest line possible and regardless of whatever line I get in don't get in my line because it's always the slowest <laughs> and if I is fast if it's some kind of imaginary way there's a lady with coupons right in front of me like I lose my mind I've never been shipwrecked you know had a face a, a snake fasten itself to me like what am I gonna do with this thing right I, I don't care who you are Paul had a bad day now if I'm Paul I gotta be thinking, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? But but think about this for just a second. The first time that we see a snake in the Bible is in Genesis chapter three, and it's the devil taking the form uh, of a snake. And ultimately, he distracted Adam and Eve for who God called them to be and what God called them to do. And what we see in Genesis three can happen today. But if he can't distract us, he, or if he can distract us, he can destroy us. If he can get us to take our eyes off Jesus and put them on anything else, it will destroy us. And you know this from your real life experience. Distractions can be deadly. We all have heard a story of distracted driving, how it's ruined lives. See, the enemy knows that if he can just take our eyes off Jesus just a little bit and place them on our circumstances or place them on other people, if we can just focus on on our pain, he has a shot at destroying our faith. And so, so if you have a crazy circumstance going on in your life right now, maybe, just maybe, it's the enemy trying to distract you before you hit your breakthrough. Right? He's trying to hold you back from who God has called you to be and what God has called you to do because if he can distract you, he can destroy you. Back to the account. It says, when the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, you're picturing this, right? Hanging from his hand, they said to each other, this man must be a what? A murderer. For though he has escaped from the sea, the goddess justice has not allowed him to live. Now, th- this is amazing. They evaluated where Paul stood with God the exact same way that you and I evaluate where we stand with God. Isn't, isn't this amazing? They evaluated where Paul stood with God based on his experience. And they're like, God, stick to you, bro. <laughs> Can you imagine? I just saw you swim out of the sea, like a sea monster coming out of the ocean, and you get to the ocean by the fire, and a viper fastens itself to you. Like, this is New Testament version of Final Destination. <laughs> this is awesome, Right? They said to each other, this man must be a murderer. Guess what? That was true. That was true. Paul was a murderer. In fact, the books of Acts, it tells us that. I mean, do you think for just a split second that Paul was wondering, is God trying to pay me back? Do you think for maybe just a second, he flashes through his mind the people that he had murdered? Paul didn't just have a painful present. He had a painful 
past as well. But when the first followers of Jesus, they, they follow Jesus and they, they record how to follow Jesus, they record not the absence of pain, but the presence of a purpose. Because of who God is, because of what God's done, because God's not done with him and God's not done with you. Paul took a, uh, some, some advice from Taylor Swift. He shook it off. He shook it off. Check it out. But Paul shook the snake. That's where she got it. Shook it off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. And the people experienced, uh, ex- expected him to swell up and, and, or suddenly fall dead. I mean, can you imagine? You gather around the fire. Hey, you gotta watch this guy. He's gonna swell up and pass out any second. Like, let's get some popcorn. Let's just watch this guy, right? They're gathered around to watch this whole thing play, take place. And it says, after a long time, or after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their mind and said he was a what? God. <laughs> Aren't people weird? You're a murderer. No, you're God. Never mind. Like I tell you, my mind. Like this is crazy. All that to say is that they had a limited perspective on life. And get this: you have a limited perspective on life and pain. We can't trust the way that we naturally see things. Now, now, even though he didn't die, his life still didn't get any better. Later on that year, around 66 A.D., Paul is in prison in Rome. And what's so weird about this is that Paul had wanted to go to Rome for the last few years of his life. Everyone knew that Paul wanted to go in Rome to preach Jesus in Rome. And he knew that he knew that he knew if he could just get to Rome, it would spread all over the world. And Paul finally got to go to Rome, but he didn't get to preach Jesus the way that he thought. Instead, he was in Rome as a prisoner. He was locked up under house arrest, chained to Roman guards, a new guard every eight hours awaiting possible execution. See, he, what he wanted to happen is not what happened. A lot of us are in that moment, aren't we? We, we wanted things to happen, but it didn't happen the way we wanted them, happen, wanted them to happen. God, if you just help me get this degree, but then we get the degree and we're struggling to find a job, it's like, God, where are you? God, just give me, help me marry the sweetheart. Like, I, God, it'll be amazing, but that you marry your sweetheart, and it's not amazing. It's, it's difficult. It's like, God, where are you? Or maybe you're at this point in your life where, where you thought, hey, once I get to this age, I won't struggle with anything, but you're that age, and you struggle. You're like, God, where are you? That's the tension. That's where Paul was. This is what I want, and this is what's happening to me. God, I wanted to preach Jesus, but I'm a prisoner. And while Paul was in prison in Rome, he actually wrote to the church of Philippi. And I want you to look at what Paul could have said when he wrote to the church of Philippi. Not what he said, but what he could have said. And if it would have been in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, and the NWV, the New Winers Version. This is what he could have said. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me is really terrible. I'm depressed. Let's just give up, right? That's what he could have said. As a result of what I've been through, I've been through the storm, lost at sea, I've uh, stumbled with rocks, it, snakes fastened itself to me, right? And now I'm in prison. As a result of my life, I'm thinking about quitting the group. I think I'm going to quit the, the church. I think I'm definitely going to quit the Jesus, right? That's what Paul could have said. And for those of you who may be new to church, just so you know, the NWV is not a real version, so don't quote that to me. But, but this is what Paul actually said. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the what? The gospel. Because as I look back, as I gain perspective, I've discovered that the difficulty that I've faced is all in how I I frame it. See, I can't control what happens to me, but I can control how I frame life, right? So if you're ever going to start or restart or attempt to share your faith, you have to realize how to frame it. Because when the pain comes, it looks like this is all I'm going to see. There's no hope. Right? It looks terrible, right? Uh, this is the only part. But you have to realize you're a part of a larger picture. You're a part of a bigger picture. So when, you, when things come at you that you can't control, you can't control certain parts of your story, but you can control how you frame it, realizing that you're a part of a grander story, a bigger story. So Paul would say, hey, I know it's bad. I know you wouldn't wish that on anybody, right? But it's all in how you frame it. I know you wanted to go and preach in Rome, but you're actually a prisoner in Rome, right? It's how you frame it. I can't, you can't control what happens to you but you can control how it's framed. What has happened to me, he says, has actually served to advance the gospel. And as a result, it is clear, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for who? For Christ. Everyone else thought it was bad, right? Everyone else, but but, 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 but God strategically placed me with the Roman soldiers. 
right, who were influential in, in Rome. They, they, they locked me to one, a new one every, every night. They're, they're chained up to me. So Paul's like, who do you think the real prisoner is? Me or him, right? It's him. Can you imagine being chained for, for Paul for eight hours? Hey, let me tell you about Jesus. No, I'm busy. No, you're not. You're chained to me, right? Or who's the real prisoner? See, you can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you frame it and know that you're part of a bigger picture. He says, and because of my change, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear, right? <laughs> you would think that because of my chains, people would be less confident, but they say it's a bigger picture, right? You would think that because of my chains, we would get less work done, but it's all in how I frame it because I'm sitting here in prison, you know, right? But, but God is using me. Right? God's still moving. God's still at work. I, God is still active. In fact, it's because Paul was in prison that we have certain parts of the Bible. You, like, you know that, right? L- ladies, you know, if Paul wasn't in prison, we wouldn't have uh, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. If Paul wasn't in prison, we would not have, I could do all this through him who gives me strength. We wouldn't have any of that. If Paul wasn't in prison, we wouldn't have significant parts of our New Testament. If Paul wasn't in prison, we wouldn't have significant parts of our theology. I mean, I could argue that after Jesus, the, uh, the Apostle Paul's writings and teachings ha- have done more to shape our culture more than anyone else who have ever lived. And Paul's pain, Paul's pain, Paul's pain, hear me, Paul's pain was a part of all of that. It was. You can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you frame it. The Apostle Paul had no idea what, was, what hung in the balance of his decision to frame everything he saw. Before Jesus transforms our hearts, so we will always be tempted to examine our pain and suffering through the loss or in loss within the context of our life alone. But when you look back on the first followers of Jesus, no matter what they went through, no matter what they endured, no matter how difficult it was, they framed their lives through a resurrected Jesus. They framed their lives through through the cross of Christ. What what if you came to this moment with a big old bag of pain? I'm just asking you, what, what what if God could do something with that? What if that pain wasn't wasted? What if God could use your pain to change lives forever? What if God could use your pain to change the world forever? See, the Apostle Paul had no idea what hung the balance of his decision to frame everything he saw. I want you to just use your imagination for just a second. I want you to imagine that you and I were able to go back to Paul in his prison cell right before his execution, and we could sit down with him. I mean, imagine that if we could tell him, Paul, 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 don't be discouraged. It worked. Paul, I know by what you see, it's hard to even believe, but imagine this one day, one day there will be no Roman Empire. One day there there will be churches all over the world in every major city in the world. Paul, all those letters that you wrote and you handed them to trusted friends and you wondered, would they ever reach their their destination? (laughs) Not only did those letters make it to Ephesus and Thessalonica and Philippi, no, those letters impacted the entire world for the last 2,000 years. Those letters, those precious letters, they've been translated into 1,200 different languages. Paul, the church that you're in chains for, the church that you love, the the movement that you sacrificed for, it is still moving 2,000 years later. I mean, can you you imagine this? And Paul had no idea what hung on the balance of his decision to frame everything he saw, but it happened just like Jesus said. And just like Paul you and I have been invited to participate in the activity of God in this world. And so as you and I try to start or restart or share our faith, I just want to ask you one more question. What's your next step? What's your next step? Like for some of you, it's meeting Jesus at the very beginning point in the waters of baptism. Well, what's your next step? For some of you, it's more than just attending a church or checking things out online. You're trying to move your line from online to on mission and you become fully engaged here at Victory. Like, what's your next step? For some of you, it's a step towards groups. You've been trying to avoid groups for years, but you know that you need someone to help pick you back up when life hits you with some rocks. What's your next step? What's your next step? So for some of you, it's a step towards serving, using your gifts, seeing what God could do through you. What is your next step? And for some of you, it's a step towards generosity, 
right? Knowing that, that you're going to be sacrificially generous and your money is on the move here. That the church is the only eternal investment possible. So what, what is your next step? For some of you, it's, it's even bigger than that. It's, it's deeper than that. And for some of you, you're wrestling with the call of God on your life and your heavenly father wants you to, to leave whatever it is you're doing right now. Say goodbye to your old life, right? And devote the rest of your life to serving him in some capacity. No matter what your next step is, whatever you're considering, whatever you're thinking about, whatever's stirring around in your heart, whatever it is that God's doing, I just encourage you, pay attention to that. Pay attention to that. Pay attention to that. See, the starting point of our next step with Jesus, it all begins with an invitation from Jesus. So no matter what you're, where you're at or no matter what you struggle with or no matter what's still wrong in your life, Jesus would lock eyes with you and he would simply say, would you follow me? Would you follow me? Would you join me in changing the world? Would you join me and, and with a greater story? Would you trust me with the bigger picture? Would you follow me? Would you follow me past your past? Would you follow me past your doubts? Would you follow me past the pain and into your purpose? Would you follow me? Would you follow me? Would you follow me? Would you pray with me? Father, I just thank you so much that we have these texts in our life that we can know that your pursuit of us. Father, I know right now there's so many people in our church and even watching online that are struggling with unimaginable pain and heartbreak, and it is dark. But Father, as they trust in you and lean into you, Father, I pray that you would draw near to them just like you promised, that they would sense your peace and your healing in that moment. Father, I pray for, for those of us who are right there to take that next step, Father, that you would encourage us, that you would give us wisdom to know what that next step is, and that you would give us the courage and the boldness to actually take it. And Father, may we live differently because the foundation of our faith, the starting point of our faith is the nail-scarred, resurrected feet of Jesus. And we know in the end, we win. So may we be bold for you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Every one of a single one of us has a next step. That's me included. And uh, if today's the day for you to become more fully engaged, we'd love to have a conversation with you. If you're here in person, it's out the door to the left, to the next steps room. If you're online and you want to be fully engaged, go from online to on mission. Start a conversation with us. 317-576-2288. Right? And maybe share this message. Share this message with somebody specific. Hey, I know you're struggling but there's gonna be purpose in this. I'm praying for you. I'm pulling for you. Here specifically, I wanna share this with you. And remember here at Victory, we don't just go to church. We are the church everywhere we go. So may we live differently because we serve a resurrected Jesus. Have a great week.